Hi. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about hyperbolicity in Tigmoy space and ultimately mention uh, a joint result with Jeremy Kahn that might link geometric and dynamical hyperbolicity in Tigmoy space. Uh, but before I get to Tigmoy space, I want to do a review of of hyperbolicity in hyperbolic space. So let's start with geometric hyperbolicity in the hyperbolic plane. Uh, so I'll, I'll use the disk model. Um, and uh, one way to think about geometric hyperbolicity is to think about um, uh, is to think about triangles. Uh, and the result here, I should fix my triangle a little bit. Uh, is that triangles are thin. The, the, so there exists delta greater than zero such that all triangles where all three sides are geodesics are delta thin. Uh, and this is called being Gromov hyperbolic. Uh, and what does delta thin mean? It means for every point on a side, uh, there's some corresponding point on another side of the triangle at most delta away. Uh, so unlike in Euclidean space, the, the sides in essence sort of curve in to meet each other. Um, it looks more like a triangle in a tree uh, than in Euclidean space. Uh, so that's that's um, the sort of geometric hyperbolicity I like to focus on. For dynamical hyperbolicity, let me mention the following. Um, and this is going to be about geodesic flow. So let GT from the unit tangent bundle of hyperbolic space to itself uh, be the geodesic flow. Um, and we're going to use the standard identification between the unit tangent bundle uh, and PSL 2R. Um, and using this, uh, the geodesic flow is right multiplication uh, by the matrix e to the t over 2, 0, 0, e to the minus t over 2. Uh, <clears throat> And we'll also be interested in two other one parameter subgroups of SL2R. So we can also consider the right multiplication by uh, US, which is 1S01, and U bar. S, which is one zero S one. Um, and these correspond to Horace cycle flow. And I'll draw you the picture. So I'll draw a really big circle. Um, and uh, I'll draw a geodesic. 
that's a geodesic and I have some point on it uh, and some tangent vector V at that point. Um, then of course, geodesic flow just moves further along the geodesic. Um, and then, uh, the two horror cycle flows, um, we can think of um, as moving along uh, these two, these two horror cycles, which in this disk model look like um, circles tangent to the boundary. So this might be US V for some value of V. Um, and then uh, we also draw this other horror cycle in the other direction. I'm not going to get this quite right. My picture is unfortunately not perfect. Um, and then, so maybe uh, um, something over he here might be U bar S B. Um, and these are uh, connected to the start and end points of the geodesic by their own geodesic. So if you look at the backwards geodesic here, it's asymptotic. And then the forward geodesic here, it's asymptotic to the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and then the most uh, important relationship between these flows um, is given by the identity uh, um, if you first horror cycle flow and then geodesic flow that's the same as uh, changing the order but you scale the horror cycle flow Um, and so, for example, here you could see that this over here might be the result of uh, first horror cycle flow and then geodesic flow. So this might be G T of US B. Um, and you can see that this, this distance between these two points is getting much smaller. Uh, so it's gotten smaller by this this factor of e to the minus t. Um, and so we have these different directions uh, if you, you move in this unstable horror cycle or the stable horror cycle and then geodesic flow. Um, sort of the, these directions right here are contracted, um, whereas these directions here um, are expanded. Uh, when you go forward, and this is this is characteristic of um, dynamical hyperbolicity. Uh, and I just to elaborate on this, let's say that v and v prime differ by a small movement in the US bar direction, so the unstable direction. So I E V prime equals U bar epsilon of V. Uh, then the picture we have is the following. Um, so uh, I draw this tangent circle. 
and then I have uh, maybe B and then nearby B bar B prime. So if they were in the backwards direction, they'd be asymptotic in the forwards direction. Um, what happens is they stay sort of close for a while. Uh, so you can see that um, maybe for a while they stay close and then they very quickly shoot off away from each other. Um, so these two points, if you think about B and B prime, their GT orbits stay distance less than or equal to one from each other for a while. That's this gray region in the picture. And that would be up till time uh, about logarithmic in epsilon. And then diverge uh fast exponentially about as fast as they they can and what you're think what you're supposed to think about is that this looks a lot like uh, a thin triangle so if you imagine a, a third side here um the only way to have thin triangles is to have some of the the edges as they leave the vertex stay apart for a while and then they quickly go apart and then the third geodesic joins them uh, so this is actually very closely related to the geometric uh, hyperbolicity. Um, uh, okay, um, so that's all I want to say about hyperbolic space. Um, so now I want to talk about tight Muller space. Uh, and it'll be denoted TG, so it's um, informally it's marked genus G Riemann surfaces uh, up to some natural notion of uh, equivalence. You often just think of it as the set of marked uh, Riemann surfaces, um, and it's a it's a complex manifold of dimension uh, of complex dimension 3g minus 3. Uh, and it has a, a, a number of distinguished metrics, but one that's going to, uh, that I'm going to focus on today, which is called the Teichmuller metric. Uh, um, and uh, what the Teichmuller metric does uh, so there's a number of ways to define it. I want to start off by saying it measures how much a map uh, between two Riemann surfaces must distort angles. So if they were the same Riemann surface, uh, there would be a conformal map between them and that doesn't distort angles at all. Um, uh, so it, it, it directly uh, measures the, the, the failure um, of the existence of a conformal map. Uh, it says if you have a map between them, how non-conformal does it have to be? Uh, so just to give you the form of this definition without uh, getting too lost in the weeds. So the Teichmuller distance between two points of Teichmuller space uh, roughly looks like the following. You take an inf um, over all maps or all maps in the right homotopy class uh, between the two Riemann surfaces. Uh, and then you look at the soup over points in X of um, what I'll denote KFP. And uh, whatever this is, 
it's a measure of how much F distorts angles at P. It's the dilatation, um, but we're not going to need the exact um, the exact de definition. Uh, for now, I want to point out that it involves a soup, and I'll come back to that point later. Um, and uh, it's not apparent from the definition, but this is actually a Finsler metric. It's not Ramanian. A Ramanian metric is given by an inner product on each tangent space. A Finsler metric is given by a norm on each tangent uh, space, uh, and the norm doesn't have to come from an inner product. Um, okay, so that's that's the preliminaries. So now I want to talk about uh, geometric hyperbolicity in Teichmuller space. Um, so I think one one appropriate starting point and some context given the other lectures in this series is the following theorem of Royden. Uh, which says the Teichmuller metric uh, is the Kobayashi metric. So as I think will feature very prominently in other talks in this uh, mini conference. Um, on any complex manifold, you can define what's called the Kobayashi pseudometric. Uh, it's a metric except that the difference between distance different points might be zero. If the Kobayashi pseudometric is actually a metric, you, you call the complex manifold Kobayashi hyperbolic. Uh, so in this case, the Kobayashi pseudometric is equal to the Teichmuller metric. So it's actually an honest metric. Um, uh, and, and this itself is some form of hyperbolicity. Um, but this is, this is I, I mentioned this mainly for context. So maybe even just put this in parentheses. Uh, this is not the direction I'm going to go in this talk. Um, uh, something more important is uh, the, the theory of geodesics is very nice in Teichmuller space. So an, a, a very old theorem of Teichmuller says there exists a unique uh, Teichmuller geodesic uh, joining any two points in Teichmuller space. Um, and it will be very important later that from a certain point of view, we know exactly what this geodesic is, uh, which is quite amazing because in, you know, even in Ramanian manifolds, you don't usually get to know what the geodesics are in any precise sense. Uh, so there are many points of view in Teichmuller theory that are different from each other. From one of those points of view, we know exactly what the geodesics are. Um, and, and this already is a little indication of hypervelocity in Teichmuller space. You should keep in mind that in a, in a negatively curved manifold, there's a, a unique geodesic joining every pair of points. Uh, but if there's positive curvature, like on the sphere, uh, you could have multiple geodesics uh, joining a pair of points, even in a simply connected space. Um, OK, so now uh, on the, the theme of hypervelocity, I'll mention this, this old result. From about 50, it was published in 59 that says uh, TG is hyperbolic in, in a fairly strong sense, uh, or, or rather, it has negative curvature in a fairly strong sense. Uh, and this was immediately followed up by a theorem 
of Mazur, which was published in 75. I think I got a date wrong here. Maybe this is 69. I thought the difference, the, the um, I think at least one of these is wrong because I thought that the, the dates were supposed to be very close to each other. Um, uh, but this was followed up by uh, other people. Uh, um, uh, and the second theorem is that uh, TG does not have negative curvature. Um, so there's some tension here, and uh, the tension is that this was wrong. Uh, there was a mistake in the proof, and ultimately it's just not true. Teichmuller space, uh, there's no sense it's in which it's hyperbolic or has negative curvature, or even that it has non-positive curvature. And um, what Mazur did is extremely striking. What he found is uh, he found examples of points in Teichmuller space with two different geodesic rays leaving them that stayed bounded distance apart. So we gave two geodesic rays leaving a point that stayed bounded distance apart. So if Teichmuller space was negatively curved, they would diverge exponentially. Uh, and even if it had non-positive cur curvature, they should at least diverge linearly. Um, this is actually a feature of positive curvature, uh, which is quite striking. Um, uh, uh, so that, that was the original result of, of Mazur, and then it was followed up by these other people, you know, um, clarifying the, the failure of hyperbolicity. Uh, and on that topic, I want to go back to the definition of the Teichmuller metric. Uh, and it's something with a soup in it. Um, and you should think of the soup norm, for example, on R2. Uh, the soup norm in R2, the geodesics are extremely far from unique to each other. Um, uh, it has a lot of behavior of positive curvature, actually. So the modern point of view, I think, hindsight is 2020. We shouldn't have expected anything with a soup in it um, uh, to, to be actually negatively curved or hyperbolic. Um, uh, and and that's, that's what these uh, results indicate. And I'll mention in particular, Minsky clarified that there actually really is some, some part of Teichmuller space that looks like um, sort of like the soup metric on R2. Uh, so, so that's the bad news, but the, it comes uh, with a lot of good news also. Um, so for example, a more recent result of Rafi is that um, triangles in the thick part of Teichmuller space, and I'll remind you what this is in a second, Tg epsilon are delta thin, where delta depends on this, this epsilon. Uh, so, so what is this? Um, <clears throat> so I'll just have a little discussion about this. To start, if you don't know about the thick part, let's just say there are a lot of thin triangles. Um, uh, um, so the, the definition is that uh, this thick part is the set of surfaces with a systole, hyperbolic systole, at least epsilon. Um, and there's some important context here. So Teichmuller space uh, covers moduli space, which is the quotient of Teichmuller space by the the mapping class group. Um, and inside a Teichmuller space, I have this epsilon thick part, and it covers uh, the similarly defined epsilon uh, thick part of, of Mg. Um, and the epsilon thin part of Mg is compact. Um, 
so the the takeaway from this is somehow uh it's the non-compactness of uh, moduli space uh, that stops Eigenmuller space from uh, being negatively curved. Uh, and so the, the aspects of positive curvature are somehow in the cusps of MG or in the horribles in Teichmuller space would be a more precise uh, way to put that. Um, uh, but still the, the takeaway should be that TG is mostly, uh, or to a very significant extent, uh, hyperbolic. Uh, and and a precise form of this was even uh, proven by uh, Spencer Dowdle and uh, Moon Duchin and Howard Mazur. Uh, and what they looked at is they looked at big spheres and they looked at typical pairs of points. Uh, on the boundary of the sphere, and then they looked at the triangle um, formed by that, and they were typically thin. So somehow, by at least one notion of sort of a random triangle, uh, a lot of random triangles are thin. Uh, so there is a lot of geometric hyperbolicity. Um, uh, okay, and then all of this hyperbolicity here is is um, uh, the results I'm referring to all use the type millimetric. Okay, so that 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 sort of only scratches the surface, but that's all I'm going to say about geometric hyperbolicity of type millimetric space today. Um, now I want to uh, transition and talk about dynamical hyperbolicity. Just one second. Okay, so now I want to talk about dynamical hyperbolicity of tight mode space. Um, <clears throat> So uh, many of you may already be um, used to this, uh, but I'll write it anyways. So using the particular geometry of Teichmuller space, this is sort of a weird thing. Um, it's possible to translate geodesic flow on the tangent bundle of Teichmuller space uh, to its cotangent bundle. Um, formally, this has to do with the strict convexity of the unit balls uh, um, for the, the norms defining the type of metric, uh, but it's, it's nothing to dwell on. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, uh, just trust me, we're going to think about a flow on the, um, the cotangent bundle, uh, and the orbits of this flow will project to geodesics in type Muller space. Um, and the reason we do this is because from this point of view, we have a, a much more explicit understanding 
of what the flow is. Um, so uh, the cotangent bundle of Teichmuller space uh, is um, QTG, which is the bundle of quadratic differentials. Um, so a typical point uh, in the cotangent bundle is a Riemann surface uh, together with a, a quadratic differential, a holomorphic quadratic differential. Um, uh, so a quadratic differential is something that locally looks like uh, a holomorphic function times dz squared and satisfies an appropriate uh, transition rule for change of coordinates. Um, and uh, every quadratic differential can be uh, presented uh, by polygons in uh, the plane. So we can give it as a complex plane or as uh, R2. Um, and so the, the easiest example is the square with the edges identified uh, that uh, is the Riemann surface C mod Z adjoint I with the quadratic differential that in local standard local coordinates is dz squared. Um, and so in general, you might have a lot of polygons. Uh, the edges would be identified uh, via maps of the form v maps to plus or minus z plus c. So uh, translations composed with rotation by 180 degrees. Um, so you glue the edges of the polygons uh, via such maps in, in such a way to get a closed surface. Uh, and the quadratic differential um, is locally just uh, dz squared away from the, the vertices. Um, and it'll be relevant soon that there's a lot of ways to do this. Uh, this is all up to cut and paste. Um, and what I mean by that is, for example, if I take this standard square torus and um, I uh, cut it along its diagonal, uh, and then I can uh, take that and move it over. Um, so I can take this, this triangle and sort of move it over there. And if I do that, I get something that looks instead like this. Uh, and these actually define the same Riemann surface and the same uh, quadratic differential. Um, and that's a uh, subtlety of this, this polygonal point of view that it's not even so clear um, when uh, two polygonal presentations define the same surface or nearby surfaces. Uh, you might have a, a presentation with very stretched out um, degenerate looking polygons and maybe you can cut them up and re them to a very reasonable picture. Um, uh, the, anyways, the reason we like this point of view um, is uh, via these polygonal presentations we have 
an action of two by two matrices uh, on the bundle of quadratic differentials, or really I should say the non-zero quadratic differentials. Um, and you just act on the polygons and keep the same edge gluings and get a new quadratic differential in that way. Um, uh, so for example, if I took e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t, uh, and applied it to the square torus, I would get um, a torus that was long and thin. Uh, Um, and in this case, the surface really is very degenerate, but sometimes you can cut up the degenerate polygons and make them look much more reasonable. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, um, so uh, essentially Teichmuller's theorem uh, is that the orbits of e to the t, 0, 0, e to the minus t uh, on the bundle of quadratic differentials uh, project to geodesics under the natural projection map uh, that will denote pi from the bundle to type more space. And this is just a forgetful map. It sends a Riemann surface and a quadratic differential to the Riemann surface. Uh, so this, um, usually called this matrix, say, GT, uh, this gives the type and GDZ flow on the bundle of quadratic differentials. Um, OK, so I want to talk uh, a little bit about this flow. Um, so the uh, edges of the polygons as complex numbers. So each edge, if I orient it in some way, gives me a complex number, um, which you'd like if it is the difference in the complex plane between the, the, the end of the edge and its beginning. Uh, the edges of these polygons give local coordinates for Q, T, G, for this bundle. Um, and these local coordinates uh, look like Xi or Xj plus I, Yj. Uh, and there's a bunch of them. Uh, and so they, they live in. Uh, the complex numbers to the 6g minus 6. Uh, so this is just, I keep track of the edges, a bunch of the edges of the polygon, uh, enough of them to determine everything else. Um, and, and these are only local coordinates, and that's important to appreciate. Uh, it's very hard to understand the effect of, of cutting up and regluing um, the polygons. And that's a major difficulty. But at least locally, uh, the geodesic flow uh, is just, it takes these coordinates. So it takes a point with these coordinates uh, and it sends it to the point where you just scale the coordinates. Uh, and that's clear because that's what the, this this matrix does. This e to the t zero zero e to the minus t increases the x coordinates by a factor of e to the t and decreases the y coordinates um, by a factor of uh, t. Um, and so it it seems like we can um, we can see some dynamical hyperbolicity. In that um, if we have a point xq and then a nearby point x prime q prime, 
well, if we got from XQ to XQ prime uh, by changing just the X coordinates, then um, the X coordinates are hit by an E to the T. So we expect these uh, to diverge very fast. Um, on the other hand, if we uh, got from XQ to a nearby X prime, Q prime by only changing the imaginary coordinates, the imaginary coordinates are hit by this E to the minus T. Um, and so these two points should converge very quickly. Uh, and this shows you that you expect stable and unstable manifolds, uh, different directions where you expect the flow to expand and contract. Uh, and this, this is what people refer to as dynamical hyperbolicity. But, so there is a but here. Unfortunately, it's not quite so easy. The cut and paste uh, equivalence um, makes this uh, hard or impossible, as in I don't know how to do it, to directly uh, verify some dynamical hyperbolicity. So I expect that if I uh, changed the only the imaginary parts of it, then the geodesic uh, flow orbits converge. Um, but I have this local understanding, so I stretch out my polygons, but then I should try to cut them up and reassemble them. Um, and I don't understand that cutting up and reassembling uh, process very well. Um, uh, so that this cut and paste equivalence is um, closely related to what's called the Kinsevich shortage co-cycle. That co-cycle is essentially the linearization of the cut and paste equivalence. And huge amounts of study goes into um, uh, examining the Kinsevich shortage co-cycle because it's the difficult uh, piece here. Um, uh, but in any case, one thing I want to emphasize is it's very hard to just work in any elementary way and, and verify this hyperbolicity. You have this e to the t and this e to the minus t, but maybe they're overpowered by the effect of the cut and paste equivalence and you don't get what you want. Um, uh, so instead of trying to do this directly, if we want to verify this hyperbolicity, so I should say this hyperbolicity, there, there is some hyperbolicity here and it goes back to um, uh, Maser and Veach, but I'm going to give a more modern perspective. Um, so instead, uh, let's use a more intrinsic point of view. So th this was a little bit uh, extrinsic or non-canonical because I had to pick a polygonal presentation. And, and the indeterminacy there is exactly what makes it hard. So I want to avoid picking any sort of polygonal presentation. Um, so we're going to use a more intrinsic notion of um, the tangent space to the bundle of quadratic differentials. So uh, one notion is if the space is locally uh, c to the 6g minus 6, well, then its tangent space should be c to the 6g minus 6. Um, and you can deform just by changing all these edge vectors, but I want to avoid that. Uh, so how do you do that? Um, so what you do is you, you use the fact that, so I'll say easy fact. Um, essentially you want to use cohomology to, uh, to get a more intrinsic notion of a local coordinate or a more intrinsic description of the tangent space, um, but you're stymied because the quadratic differential doesn't directly give you a cohomology class. Uh, but it does on uh, a double cover, as I'll now explain. Um, so there exists a unique uh, two to one cover. So we call it rho from x hat to x, and it's two to one. Uh, such that the pullback of Q to X hat is the square of an abelian differential. 
Okay, so this could be meaningfully compared to the fact that a non-orientable double cover uh, has a, or non-orientable manifold has a, a unique double cover uh, that is oriented. Um, so in this case, you want W to be, you want omega to be the square root of Q and you can do that locally. And there are two choices and that leads to a double cover. Uh, and, and just notation, this double cover, it'll have deck group uh, tau. So tau is an involution on X uh, hat and the quotient is, is X. Um, so then a, a description of the tangent space uh, is as follows. So the bundle of, of uh, quadratic differentials. So it's isomorphic to, um, well, maybe I'll sort of build it up slowly. So if I was interested in local coordinates for the space of abelian differentials um, uh, on x hat, um, it's stratum, then it's it's well known that you would use a relative cohomology group for that. Um, but I don't want the, the whole stratum. I only want uh, the ones that come about from this double construct, this double cover construction. Uh, and those will have uh, a symmetry with respect to the deck group. Um, and so that's given by taking the, the minus one eigenspace for the action of uh, the deck group. Minus one uh, eigenspace. Minus one. So essentially, you can see um, just straight from the definitions that uh, this tau negates omega. Uh, so it's going to be in the minus one eigenspace. Uh, and then just a linear algebra, little linear bit of linear algebra shows that. Um, the minus one eigenspace in relative cohomology is, is isomorphic to the minus one eigenspace in absolute cohomology. So you can drop the relative part. Um, so I'm going to denote this uh, h1 minus one x hat c. And this, this bottom minus one is referring to the fact that it's the minus one eigenspace. So that's a description of the um, of the tangent space uh, to the stratum, and and it has a natural norm on it, which is called the Hodge norm. Um, and so, I to describe it, it's helpful to use uh, the splitting of the cohomology into uh, holomorphic one forms and anti-holomorphic one forms. Uh, so this hard norm is actually going to come from an inner product. Um, and it's defined as follows. So if I have uh, two holomorphic one forms, then um, uh, it's just given by uh, an appropriate multiple of the integral. And the multiple is just to make it positive. Uh, so the pairing of eta with itself is positive. Um, and if they're both anti-holomorphic, Uh, well, then you can define it in reference to the above just by saying that uh, it's what you get when you take complex conjugates and then they become holomorphic. And if one is holomorphic and one is anti holomorphic, then uh, they're orthogonal. So if you'd like, this is this Hodge norm is in a sense the. Um, the sort of obvious uh, L2 norm uh, on, on homology. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
but somehow it uses Hodge theory, it uses this decomposition, and so ends up being very be, being very meaningful. Um, and I want to emphasize, uh, despite the fact that it's obvious, one subtlety is that it depends. Um, so uh, h one x hat. Uh, you can think of it as locally constant in x hat. So you can deform the complex structure on x hat. Um, the topology doesn't change. And first, homology is purely a construction of homology of, of topology. So as you deform the complex structure, the, the homology is not changing in any meaningful way. But um, the Hodge norm does change. Uh, and that, that, in a sense, is the foundation for the study of variation of Hodge structures. Um, this Hodge decomposition um, here changes uh, when you change the complex structure. Um, and that, that causes the, uh, the Hodge norm to change. Um, so, uh, so the modern approach uh, to hyperbolicity, which is due to uh, Forney and uh, followed Kinsevich's uh, introduction of Hodge norm in, as a tool in, in, in type mode dynamics um, uh, is basically uh, compute and estimate uh, the derivative of the Hodge norm. Uh, so you want to know that there are certain tangent directions which are going to be the stable direction. So they're going to be contracted and certain that are going to be expanded. Um, so it's enough to understand the, the rate of change of their norm. Uh, and this is what Forney does via an analytic um, approach. And um, I will maybe comment that it's again uniform over compact sets uh, of Mg. So again, something is getting worse. Something is failing due to the non-compactness. Um, in any case, this gives stable and unstable manifolds of typical points. Um, the precise statements can be a little bit complicated because of the fact that Mg is is not uh, is not compact to if you are sort of moving along a geodesic and you really want to see a lot of dynamical hyperbolicity, then it should stay um, or at least spend a definite amount of time in a, in, in a compact set uh, in order to really accumulate the amount of hyperbolicity you'd be expecting. Um, okay, so that's the, the modern um, approach to hyperbolicity of tight Miller geodesic flow. Uh, and I should say that once you know hyperbolicity, it's easy to prove ergodicity. Um, uh, so it's a very foundational aspect of, um, of tight mode dynamics. Uh, so the, the new contribution to this story that I want to mention to you today, which is joint work with Jeremy Kahn. Um, so this again is gonna concern, uh, just to remind you, so let, I uh, the, the natural projection map. So pi goes from the bundle of quadratic differentials to tight Miller space. Um, so then, uh, if you normalize appropriately, Uh, 
then what you can do is you can look at the derivative of the projection. So d pi, pi is the projection, capital D denotes derivative. So that's the derivative of the projection. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the derivative of the projection uh, and then consider its Teichmuller norm. Uh, as I said, Teichmuller metric is, um, so this eta is gonna be a tangent vector to the stratum. Uh, so I take a tangent vector to the stratum, I apply the derivative of the projection map, I get a, a tangent space to Teichmuller space, and I'd like to know its, its Teichmuller norm. So on the one hand, this is at least the Hodge norm uh, of eta, and on the other hand, there's an upper bound two, uh, which I'll tell you in a moment. So four over R, I have to tell you what R is, and the Hodge norm. Uh, of eta. Um, so uh, I haven't completed this yet. I'm still writing. So first of all, where 2r is the length of the shortest saddle connection. So it's sort of like the systol. Again, things are getting worse as you leave compact sets. Uh, this is very, very typical. Uh, and this roughly should be sharp. Um, and eta, so eta should live in the minus one eigenspace of uh, the double cover, but here I want the extra uh, restriction that it's, uh, that it's anti-holomorphic. Um, and the reason I want this is because of the following remark. Uh, this, the, the, the bundle of quadratic differentials has twice the dimension of Teichmuller space. So it's gonna have a big kernel and the kernel of um, the derivative is the holomorphic one forms. Uh, so basically I'm, I'm excluding the kernel here and that's necessary to get the, the lower bound. Um, <clears throat> So uh, another remark, just very quickly, is this is this, so this has already been used uh, by Arana Herrera, uh, who wrote a very beautiful series of papers, uh, three papers on the effective dynamics of the mapping class group. Um, which proves a number of new results. And at some point in there as a technical tool, uh, he uses this comparison. Um, so just a, a quick word about this. We prove this by actually giving, um, uh, so we actually give a formula, a, a formula for this derivative. Um, and it's an, it's an integral formula. So there are many formulas for this derivative. There are many different points of view uh, on Teichmuller theory. Um, the specific formula that we use um, in the case of the principal stratum of quadratic differentials looks a bit like this. So we give a formula for d pi of, uh, so we have the, tangent vector to the stratum determined by this, this uh, form eta, which I'm going to assume is harmonic. Every one form has a harmonic representative. And then I, I want to pair it with a quadratic differential. And it's given by this, this formula uh, in the principal stratum. So again, this is eta h1 minus 1 hat data harmonic. Uh, so the point of view here is that we're taking, uh, that we know the derivative if we know it's pairing with all uh, cotangent vectors, all quadratic differentials. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I, I made this very vague illusion earlier. This might uh, give some relationship between geometric and dynamical hyperbolicity results, uh, I think it's an open problem to realize 
that connection, you can easily imagine how it would go um, if you have two nearby points in the bundle of quadratic differentials, if they differ at all by the unstable direction, they're going to stay together for a while and then diverge quickly. And this will look very much like a piece of a, of a thin triangle. Uh, so you can see the connection there. I think it would be an interesting problem to try to um, reprove and possibly even improve some of the dynamic, some of the geometric hyperbolicity results um, uh, by using this comparison between the Hodge norm and the type 1 norm. Uh, so what that might look like is you might take a triangle and um, at one corner you might look at the two, the, the quadratic differentials generating those geodesics, and you might try to, to um, uh, go from one to the other by moving along the stable and unstable manifolds. Uh, and then use dynamical hyperbolicity to understand how those stable and unstable um, uh, components grow over time as you as you flow forward um, along the edges, uh, and then uh, perhaps use our result to translate that into um, uh, a result on the Teichmuller distance uh, between two points on the edges. Okay, so that's everything I wanted to say uh, today. I, I look forward to talking with all of you um, in the, the online chat and then the, the discussion session. Um, uh, thank you, and I'll see you then.